Canada told the world today it's changing its approach to Indigenous rights. This work is necessary and long overdue. For years, the previous Conservative government objected to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, largely because it requires their consent before bringing in new laws or developing their land. But this government has a different approach. Tomorrow, it is Canada's intention to remove our permanent objector status and become a full supporter of the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Adopting the UN Declaration was part of the Liberal government's election promise to revamp its relationship with Aboriginal people. For this vision to be realized, Indigenous peoples need to be empowered to take back control of their own lives in partnership and with the full support of all Canadians. The UN Declaration recognizes Indigenous human rights, their right to self-determination, to their language and to land, among other things. It's not binding, but the declaration could be part of efforts towards greater Aboriginal control over community housing or health. And there's that key section that goes right to the heart of conflicts between Ottawa and many First Nations. Whether it's mining or um, an LNG um, operation, um, they would have to come in and as, as they would approach um, your government as they would approach any other government to obtain their consent. Today on Power and Politics, the opposition slammed the Liberals for having big plans but no details. What does it mean? Are we going to have to change laws? What are the costs going to be? How are we going to move it forward? One has to look at the legislation that's in place now, the Indian Act, and other pieces of federal and provincial law that are impacting on the uh, use of their traditional treaty rights that Indigenous people have been trying to exercise but have been interfered with by uh, enforcement authorities. So, so repeal the Indian Act? I'm not sure that it would automatically repeal the Indian Act, but I think that's got to be part of the equation. It's got to be part of the discussion. But at the same time, it has to be replaced by something which defines the role of the federal government insofar as its relationship with Indigenous people. To leave it blank, I think, uh, would probably be... Um, unfair and an incomplete uh, duty on the part of the federal government. They have to define what their relationship is going to be like and what their responsibilities are going to be. And they have to put some meaning to their role as the fiduciary in a relationship like that. Well, I guess they could do it one by one, um, you know, first nation by first nation. I think they have to decide um, who they're going to have a relationship with to begin with. Indian bands are defined in the Indian Act, and Indian bands are therefore a federally created entity. And the nature of the right that the courts have begun to recognize are not so much in the nature of Indian bands as they are in the nature of Indian nations or mm. First Nations. Mm. And that's true for the Métis Nation as well. In the recent Daniels case, it was true of the Inuit people back in 1928 in the case that recognized their federal status. All of that means that the federal government now has to do a lot of uh, work for itself first to define how it's going to move forward. It can't simply say, well, from now on, we're only going to do this by treaty or by separate agreements. Uh, I've heard that said, and I don't think that's going to work. I don't think it's going to work because it'll take too long. There's several hundred First Nations, not to speak of the Métis communities as well. I think what needs to be considered is what's the overall relationship going to be like and how is the federal government going to exercise its responsibility and then they need to look at the federal laws that are currently in place and decide which of those are being um, uh, that need to be uh, changed because they're hampering the nation to nation relationship. Uh, well it's closer to a sign off than a consultation uh, and that's because of the Supreme Court's decision in Chilcotin. Yes. In the Chilcotin case they basically said once Aboriginal title has been confirmed or has been recognized or has been established in law, then the government or any other party wanting to use or affect uh, or their land that is subject to the, um, the Indigenous title cannot proceed with a project or cannot do anything with regard to it without first um, obtaining the, f the prior consent of, the, of those people. Mm -hmm. And if th that consent cannot be obtained, then Canada can move forward, provided that they can meet a certain test that the Supreme Court has defined. The national interest test. Well, it's not just that. 
it has to be a, a, a substantial federal interest. It has to be um, minimally impair, impairing the uh, Aboriginal title, mm -hmm. and it has to have a um, uh, has to be weighed against the impact upon the First Nations people or the the title holders, mm -hmm. whether they're First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. So there, there's a three-pronged test that has to be met, and it's not an easy test that uh, the government's going to have to go through. But but the, because this declaration is not binding, that Supreme Court decision, the Dakota decision, means far more for Indigenous people than the UN declaration would be in terms of how how the government goes about getting consent and, and allowing things to happen, right? So Dakota decision is the law of the land right yeah. now. Yeah. And it is more. Would you say that it's more significant than the declaration we're seeing from the UN? Well, no. I think the declaration is important because it contains reference to a lot of other issues, such as culture and language retention, revival, and return to um, a return of uh, sacred artifacts, sacred lands, sacred territories, a recognition of certain rights that Indigenous people have claimed uh, throughout the uh, nature of the relationship that have not been recognized. So there are a lot of other elements that are part of the United Nations Declaration that uh, are not addressed in the Chilcotin decision. And, and do you think that this, the adoption of this, embracing this in a way that we hadn't seen with the past government, that, that this is, uh, that, that it sort of sets, sets the government on a different path in terms of its relationship with nation to nation? It is the big threshold issue that they had to get through. Uh, if they meant nation to nation relationship, then this was the document that they had to endorse. And so going forward now, the question is, how are they going to implement their endorsement?